And now it is time to move on uh, to our cases. And may I present our first presenter, um, Associate Professor Lauren Delbright from the University of Rouen. The floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Hello. So my name is Laurent Delbray. I work at the University of Rouen as a researcher and a teacher, an associate professor. So today I'm going to present uh, a topic that uh, is at the border between the teaching and the research. It's the, the goal, the, the title is Enhancing Surgical Training with 3D Printing Pathways to Mastery in Surgery. Um, this work is in charge of a thesis team. We have the thesis, PhD thesis student that is in the same time a surgeon, a pediatric surgeon at the hospital, uh, University Hospital of Rouen, where the supervisors are the professor Agnès Lias Muda, that is the chief of the pediatric section of the hospital in Rouen, and myself, I work as an associate professor in the phys material physics group at the University of Rouen. I'm the material physics guy in the team, and they are the, let's say, clinical uh, team, part of the team. So let's speak about a little bit of uh, the plan I'm going to present, a little bit of background. Then I'm going to present two subjects uh, at the border between teaching from pediat pediatric uh, students and then also uh, the research in material science. In terms of uh, background, what we can say is that as an uh, history of uh, surgical training, uh, we have different period in time from the antiquity where we had some animal training for uh, surgical training that in the Middle Age, we have a huge, we had a huge regression in the training of uh, the surgical um, mastery. And then at this moment, we had a, a kind of oral transmission with no real training. It was more familial transmission. And there are some uh, uh, jobs that were associated to surgery, not a real surgery job. During the Renaissance, we have the beginning of the first, let's say, surgical training with the use of cadaver uh, as a training uh, dummies. So first dissection on cadavers and discovery of the benefits of asepsia. Then um, in the 19th century, developing of development of anesthesia, that is a good point specifically for patients. Or I think everybody will be okay with that. <laughs> then in the 20th century, uh, creation of surgical formation after the Second World War, creation of real professional uh, diploma with uh, surgical training. And now in the 20th century, creation of surgical simulators. The idea is never uh, making the first test on a patient. And that's also a good thing. Uh, we can also, everybody will be agree with it. We'll agree with that. In the French uh, law, what we say is that there is an obligation now for every surgical uh, surgeon uh, students to practice on the every domain that will be associated to what we have here. For example, laparoscopy. In French, we call that also celioscopy. All these invasive uh, things that will be used during surgery has to be trained. That's an obligation in the law for students in, in surgery. So the thing is... In France now, what we have is before any use of a, a technique uh, in a surgery room, they have to use some, let's say, some modeling, some tests that will be associated to the practice, the training of this. So we have some dummies, we have some computers, and this will be associated to, let's say, modeling, maybe associated to tools that will help to develop uh, the skills of the surgeon. So that's the use of robotic, that's the use of computer, of 3D images in order to help to develop some skills by working in for this type of celioscopy or laparoscopy before training on real patients. That's the goal of all that. 
that's quite impressive. That's very useful. The big problem with all of that is that the cost is very high. It's very, very expensive, meaning that there is no accessibility outside of the simulation centers. When you say simulation centers, you say big university hospital with big money income. And then it's impossible for every student in every place other than the simulation center to practice the celluloscopy, the laparoscopy. When you want to practice by yourself, if you want to buy some stuff to practice, we saw that, yes, let's say on Amazon, we will have some boxes in order to start that will be between 170 euros, 100 euros, and 2,000 euros. And it's the lowest price for this type of thing. So it's coming very, very expensive for a student. For a teaching section, it's also very expensive. If you, if you have a lot of students, it's impossible to have a lot for uh, very students. That's the solution that is proposed now by uh, our team on this subject is to use additive manufacturing or 3D printing in order to help propose some solution for the training of these students in, in surgery. Now, just very briefly, I'm gonna explain a little bit some 3D printing solution we are investigating. Uh, so 3D printing uh, in this idea will be the deposition for polymeric 3D printing we are using. Deposition of material layer by layer. But depositing layer by layer can be very diverse because we can use or thermoplastic or photo cross link or photo cross linkable resins. And the solution will be quite different. We have some solution in temperature depositing this type of technology, that's the most common technology, let's say FDM or FFF, fusion uh, filament deposition. We deposit a filament of polymer, or we are using a bath of liquid resin. And with UV light, we are making some cross-linking, protocol linking of the resin in order to create an object from nothing. Why? Do we use 3D printing? Because if we want to create object, we have several solutions in the world. First will be uh, the classical subtractive solution, like milling, drilling uh, an object from a stone, a block of polymer. We have also some injection in a mold. The thing is, as we can see here, if it will be very useful if we have a lot of objects like that, because we will do like in Surrey, and then we'll reduce the cost. When we are at very low amount of material of, of objects, the best thing is to use 3D printing because the cost is very low in this condition. The thing is the cost is not very low, but as we have not to create a mold and not to create all the pieces, it may be cheaper. So that's why 3D printing for this low amount of object is maybe the more useful and versatile because we can change the rules, we can change the plan, we can adjust things very easily. We can do that in every place in the world. I will put an object here, a printer, and print a three, an object like that. It's very easy. So just two examples of what the machine we are using. So we have the resin machine and the thermoplastic machine. Thermoplastic, that's this one. You saw the, the, the PhD student. <clears throat> it's a very strange PhD student. A very a surgeon at the same time, that's a uh, <laughs> non-classical PhD program, but for a non-classical project. So yeah, um, filament deposition, uh, 3D printer and a resin printer. So. I'm a little cheating on this. It's a little bit accelerated. Yeah, <laughs> 10 times or 100 times. But that's the idea. You have the bath of resin and you pull out the object from the resin with UV light on the bottom. So that kind of magical. Sure, that's not the same uh, scale of time, but that's the idea. Uh, we have a financial support because this project is associated to a financial support from the French Society of Pediatric Surgery give him some 10,000 euro and I think 10,000 euro more to the student to develop these uh, tools for teaching. And the, the deal, the goal is at the end to give some boxes like that to every student, a uh, hundred of that in order to help them to practice, to develop some techniques. And we will see at the end if you are able to be a surgeon in the same time doing some tests with the box. <laughs> Myself, I'm not, definitely not. 
So the first project is the Space Child Laparoscopic Trainer, the Laparoscopic Grasper, also in the same time. So learning laparoscopy or celluloscopy, uh, that's a mini invasive technique. The, thing, the good thing is that it's multi-specialties. It's in pediatric surgery since 1990. And We'll say in France, for example, we have 70,000 laparoscopic appendectomies in France per year. So that's used a lot in the surgery techniques for kids in France. The, if you look in the literature, you see clearly that the different tests that have been developed in surgical centers say that to be at the level, the required level, of skills you have to use and train at least 100 times. So if you are the number two in the list for an operation, that's absolutely not a good choice. So the goal is for the student to train all these 100 times in order to practice, try with this type of boxes, then after go to training centers, that's a multi-training process. But they have to train a lot in order to be efficient during a surgical operation. So that's why in this condition, they have to practice. So to practice, they have training centers, but they have also the training that can be done in classical uh, centers, in classical places, and even at home. If they want to buy this type of thing by themselves, they will pay more than 1,000 euros that we saw. Uh, we saw that for uh, buying the stuff, the training, and the graspers. And these graspers are very low quality graspers. The graspers used in surgical operation are more than 5,000 euro, I think. The, yeah, the one very expensive here, you will see. So we developed, uh, Alexi Lube, the, so the, the student developed uh, the box, this type of box. That's a space child laparoscopic trainer. That's uh, the laparoscopic tool that is developed totally in 3D printing. You will see that you have several parts. Everything is printed in like, let's say one day, something like that. Uh, it's totally 3D printing, easy to use. We see, we'll see that we can use a phone in order to observe the object we are working on and training. It mimics a little bit the idea of making a laparoscopic uh, surgery because they are using some computer and a 3D view. So the idea is to be in the same time, not to use directly your eyes, but use a screen in order to work on that. And also that cheap because the, the price is lower than five euros for the, for the box. And also you can make a lot of validation with that. That's also the good point because you can develop several boxes, several tools in order to make uh, some validation with a large uh, sample uh, test experts that will work on that and see if it's good or not. And if it's not good, we can change the plan. We can adjust. That's the good point with 3D printing. We can do it very fast by ourselves. Second point very important in this idea, that's the graspers, because the graspers is the, grip, the key point for working on that at low cost, because the, the grasper is the highest uh, price for this. So in the literature, you can see that you have some graspers that are used and made uh, different type of techniques. In 3D, you have this type of dragon flex uh, grasper, very fancy, very, very nice. You can work in different direction, move that alone. But the, the problem is that it's not fully 3D made, that you cannot make that by yourself at home. And the other point is that it's very short. That's a short grasper. And we will see that the thing with this grasper, it has to be something like 30 centimeter long. So that's a little bit mandatory for working on that. And in the same condition, that's surgery. Second grasper is a little bit the same. It can be moved in different directions, but it's very short one. So that's, that's difficult and not totally 3D printing. That's more commercial graspers. And another point is not sterilizable. And that also can be a thing. So the specification, what we need to do to achieve the goal of the PhD thesis on this subject is dimension, five millimeter diameter, very thin uh, grasper, 30 centimeter long, 360 degree of rotation by with one finger, fully 3D printed, material cost low, five lower than five euro. 
resistant, and that's the key point. 30 centimeter in a polymer printed you have to be uh, stiff enough to be able to use it as a grasper. And also, in bonus, if it can be sterilizable, that could be the, the end. That could be the, the best thing. But that's not easy. We have to understand that it's made for training. It's not made for surgical application. So the sterilizable part is not mandatory, but that could be also a good point. So in order to work on that, the first steps were topological improvement. We try to obtain the best thing with this grasper in order to mimic the, let's say, professional graspers in order to modify it. Well, at the beginning, we created a sliding system, but it was not efficient. So we made it evolve the design of the, of the grasper in order to go to this type of design. Not easy to do something in 3D printing, in a wall thing, in order to obtain the same capability that's a classical thing. In topological also adjustment, at the beginning we were with very classical shapes and we, we thought that definitively we have to adjust, we have to make smooth shapes in order to reduce the constraint in the material and not to have some breaking, for example, here at the junction between vertical parts. That's absolutely not what we have to do. With 3D printing, we do what we want in terms of topological uh, uh, objects. So we can adjust the shapes, we can modify with round things in order to reduce the accumulation of stress at the angles. That's not what we want because we are creating cracks and we break the, the systems. So yeah, so we started the printing, we started the, the, the test. We see that, yeah, that's the bath of uh, liquid resin and in one bath, we can do a lot of things in the same time. So we have the printing, we have after cleaning with that, we have the post treatment that is quite important because we are moduling, we are changing, tuning the properties of the material by post treatment with some UV light post treatment and some drying processes. And that was the first version. That's not this one, that's the previous one. We succeed in creating the grasper with let's say six or, I'm cheating a little bit, there is another small part that will be the seven parts in one batch. So in six parts, we can have this grasper. That was a, a good thing. That was the first one that was efficient enough to grasp and to make some tests. So the thing is after that, it was good and good improvements, but we have some problems with the resistance. As I told you, this part, 30 centimeter part, with a hole inside, very thin. So that's very difficult to have some, something strong enough compared to the other parts, the commercial things that are metallic parts. So it's very stiff. Here, we have polymer, five millimeter, very difficult. So the idea was to adjust, to work on the material science problematic, and that was my goal in the team. So how is it possible to adjust the material, to adjust the process in order to improve, to increase the stiffness of the material? The thing is, each part has its own, let's say, requirements in terms of mechanical properties. Some need to be, oh, we don't see anything. <laughs> Stiffness, we are somewhere resistant, some flexibility, some ductility. Ductility is an important part because when we think about this part, we say, okay, we want to be stiff, to resist. But sometimes when we increase the stiffness, we reduce the ductility. Ductility is the ability to deform without breaking. And that's what we need sometimes with this type of thing. We have, we need some ductility. So every part has its own requirements. That's what we define in the first time. And then we make some tests. We make some polymer benchmarking and characterization for that. So we changed the material. We, we used different commercial resin because the idea was to use commercial resin. The final goal is for everybody in the world to go to Amazon or whatever you want and buy some resin, commercial resin, put it in your printer and print these graspers. That's the goal. So we want to use some commercial resin, not some fancy resin that we could produce in laboratory that will be not accessible. So we tested a lot of commercial resin. Here we have like five, but we tested like 10 uh, resin in order to see what are the specification and the real properties of this resin in flexural, uh, properties because the flexure rule is very important. So use different resin, test mechanical, and then testing also the post-treatment, UV post-treatment, heat post-treatment, UV post-heat, and then 
we, we, we had some very, very interesting results on these points. What we see is changing the resin, changing the post treatment. We can tune the properties. But the thing is, when you tune the rigidity, for example, as I told you, in the meantime, at the same time, you are reducing the flexibility. You're reducing the capability of the material to deform. So we had to find something in between with the treatment, the post treatment, and not to go too high in terms of this treatment because we were reducing the flexibility of our sample and they were breaking too fast. Second part, once we define what was the good grasp, we make some tests with surgeon. We do take 31 surgeon here and we make them test all the system. Here with the graspers, with classical graspers and our graspers and the box, the wall box. And they make two exercises, the one we're gonna do and the one for precision cutting. And at the end, they are filling in a medical training center, a test, an evaluation and say, okay, what is the good point? What is the bad point with that? That was the first test. And the results were, well, let's say not so bad. Not so bad at this time. And but there are some improvement we had to make. They were a little bit fragile. They were brittle a little bit. And also we have to improve the one finger rotation. You will see with the grasper. It's important for them because when they are doing surgery, they can grasp and in the same time make a rotation of the head in order to grasp in every direction with just one finger. So that's the, that was an ultimate goal. At the beginning, I was not aware that it was so important, but yes, at the end it was. So we try to change the geometry, we change the thing in order to be more able. And now you see the Grasper V3, <laughs> not the last one. <laughs> Almost same geometry. We are focusing now on more or less same geometry, same addition, but we have some small changes in the, some specific points. So this one is the one I have today. So next step, what we're gonna do is we tested several polymer resin. We may, may be more fine on the choice of the, the, the resin. We see that with some resin with an X at the end, that strong one, it may be said, no, it's scary. That may be a very strong one, composite resin, maybe a slight resin, maybe stronger resin. Then the same thing, two exercises, one with transition of objects and one with cutting. With this test, we will try to have the validation of this guy in order to see if we are, yeah, okay for working on this grasper and what are the next steps to improve the capabilities. I told you at the end, the goal is to send this type of uh, training boxes uh, in every place in the world, not only in France, in our thing. It will be all around France because we have a lot of students in the French Pediatric Association but also all around the world. There are uh, Professor Liar Smuda is associated with some hospitals in Togo and Benin uh, in order to practice for them. So she proposed them, that to them. She went there and they worked together to see if the students were able to work with that and make some validation on this thing. The good point is that you don't have to build that in France and send that. You have to send the machine, they buy the machine, buy the resin, and they do it by themselves. The goal of that is to give that all around the world and to practice, to be able to practice, to improve the skills of the surgery uh, for the pediatric surgery, the surgeon for every student in the world. That's the ultimate goal. So we have to improve that in order to be better, more efficient and more close to professional uh, grasper in order to give a good overview of the, the teaching process for uh, this type of thing. What, what time do I have? Yes. Half time? <laughs> okay. So in the same time, I'm gonna present the, the second topic. So the first topic was uh, the work on the laparoscopic uh, surgery. Second will be a work for uh, students uh, in pediatric surgery for a uh, fracture of the elbow for kids. The thing is, when there is an, uh, a fracture for a child, uh, help of a child is very common uh, surgery. That's what uh, the doctors uh, say to me. And the thing is they have to put some wire, uh, steel, uh, stainless steel, titanium uh, in, the, in the arm in order to improve the, stiff the stiffness of the bone during the recovery. The thing is when you do that on a classical bone, 
it's not so easy, but it can be done easily because you can find exactly the place they want to put some waves. I saw that when they want to put that in the elbow breaking at the end of the arm, it's very difficult. And during that, they do that a little bit blind. They do, they put that blindly. After some years of practice, they can know more or less what they are doing, but it's never easy because it's a little bit not so common to find the exact position. Every bone will be a little different. Every position and every fracture will be a little bit different. So finding the right position for that is putting a titanium wire, then making an X-ray picture on that and seeing if it is good or not. If it's not good, you remove and you do one more time, another image and doing that. Not easy, not the right thing to do. Well, that's what how it is done now. So there is no real surgical model. So well, that's 3D image, not real image. <laughs> so that's the thing. They do that, but they don't see the bone. We see that here, but that's not. So they do that, they see a picture, and they do another time. Is it good or not? That's the thing in the same time. So first, for in terms of radiation, it's no good because you are taking a lot of pictures, not efficient, not good in the same time, and that's not easy to do. <laughs> Let's say 40 years as prototyping method to do that. Prototyping method for pediatric surgery is okay. You have a case. Here you have a rashes problem for the, uh, the this type of bones. They had a problem and they wanted to see what's the problem. You make some X-ray image of that. We print it and the surgeon saw that. Say, okay, we, we have this problem. What can we do in order to uh, help the patient? Here, we have to solve here. I believe it L1, year old, whatever. That's the prototyping method. And it is quite common in 3D printing. In the industry, they use that since centuries, not centuries, since decades, in order to have the object. When you have the object in 3D, most of the time, it's easier to observe the problem and to find solutions. In the bibliography, we see that the bones, the idea of how do we uh, do this type of Titanium wire inside the bone, we put inside what is the influence of the angle, what is the influence. So, the idea, uh, ideal case for that would be to use the 3D printing as it is used since national speed. You, have, you can find this type of thing in the literature. You have also in the literature some tests made on different bones, bones of animals bones of made by, let's say, artificially in order to mimic a little bit uh, bone, human bones. Here, when we try to drill that, the idea is, OK, we're going to print a bone. The, the ideal case would be there is a kid coming with a problem. We make an image, 3D image of the fracture. We do an image what, with the image. We print the image with the fracture. When we print the image, the surgeon can practice exactly on the actual fracture of the kid and then once 10 minutes after once he practices so exactly what is the right angle to put the wire he can go to the surgeon room surgery room with the kid and then do the surgery exactly in the same condition that he did with the 3d printed bone but to do that we have to create a bone artificially in 3d printing that will mimic the properties of the actual bone when we say the mimic it's Making the outside part of the bone and the inside part of the bone. The outside will be very tough and the inside will be like a foam, by the way, in terms of mechanical testing. So we have to make 3D print them, pretty printable, same thickness as child bone and chip production in this condition could be good. So we make some statistical work on the bone. They make some images on the scan of uh, elbow of kids that are uh, at problems on the bone and then make some measurements in order to see what is the thickness of a child bone with age, with the growing process. Second part, we're trying to try to print this type of bone. So the first part was to try Two parts, the outside part for the medullar parts of the bone, stiff parts, and the inside part that will be 
the cortical part of the bone that is more a foam. We try to do some functional uh, combination in order to see what we can do to make a lightweight uh, structure with not so resistant. But that was not the good thing. This type was not good because it was too stiff. Now we are using foam in order to mimic the inside. Then we printed this type of bone outside, empty and with a filling inside. And we made some tests. You can see here, we have a bone, not a human bone, but an animal bone, and this one, this one was a big or a pig. We have a drill at the end and a machine, and a single machine, when we are testing the resistance of the bone when we try to uh, make a drill inside. So the idea is to, is it possible to see what is the force necessary that will be necessary to drilling the, the bone in this type of condition. Here, we have the drilling scenario that's the preliminary uh, uh, results for a bit, an animal. And then we have the same thing for our uh, 3D printed bone. Same shape, we have the outside part going inside, going in the middle and going outside and in the middle. We have also a part that will be very low energy, exactly like in an animal bone. So we are adjusting now our process and we are adjusting our printing and now we are getting closer and closer to the animal part. Animal part will be here and our plastic 3D printed part will be here. So we adjust the stiffness of the material by changing the material from some amorphous material, some crystallized material in order to adjust the stiffness and to adjust the thickness of the outside parts of the bone. Uh, and uh, cortical parts of the bone. That's a language I'm, I'm learning. Right? <laughs> the cortical part and the medial part. The cortical part will be up to this and the medial part has to be very uh, smooth. And we are creating at the end some educational model. We give that to parents of injured children, to experts in order to, to check that, to drill also, and to students in order to test that. And the question is, do you understand the pathology with 3D model? For the parents and the kids, that's very important because they see what they have. They see what we're going to do to the kids. Okay, this is the breaking. This is the problem. That's how we will fix. Okay, do you see that? Okay, And they see that in terms of learning, of process, of understanding that, that's much more interesting for the kid and the parents to understand that. And for the experts doing that, they see, okay, is this... Uh, surgical educational model is good enough to help before the surgery. So what do we have to uh, improve? What is the best uh, way to do? So evaluation of all this type of process. And then at the end, we have an educational process. And if we are very good at the end, we will be able to create. So that's in more or less in progress. And the outside part will be kind of silicon fat in order to mimic not only the bone, but also the flesh around, because that will be the ultimate goal mimic the flesh and the bone inside for a very good educational model. Thanks a lot.